gonna dive in from the story of Samson to, to tell you just 10 things about the church that we can learn from the story of Samson. If you have Judges chapter 16 verse 26 and 27, all of our notes on Version Bible app under events, you have to enable your notification location so that you can see the notes, you can save them straight to your phone. Then Samson said to the lad who held him by the hand, let me feel the pillars which support the temple so that I can lean on them. Now the temple was full of men and women and all the lords of the Philistines were there. About 3,000 men and women on the roof watching while Samson performed. And verse 30. So that the dead that he killed at his death were more than he had killed in his life. Samson is a very unique character in the book of Judges. And one of the reasons he did so much mess, he was the only judge that God gifted to a prayerless generation. Every judge ever showed up in the book of Judges, the Bible says Israel cried. Nobody cried out for revival before Samson came. Which is one of the reasons he was one of the judges whom his generation did not embrace. Let me say it again. Prayer prepares you for what God has prepared for you. If you don't pray, God will still do what God said He will do. You just will not cooperate with God. If you and I don't pray, God will still send Samson. It's just the Samson will malfunction. Samson did some pretty weird things and people say, oh Samson was so immoral. Samson was the playboy. But you know, I wonder, I wonder what would have happened if Israel would have prayed. They would have embraced their deliverer if they would have embraced Samson I wonder if Samson would have been screwing up like he was I wonder if Samson would have been messing up like he was God is going to still do revival because God is faithful to his word and God is faithful to his character but my friend I don't want to be like that servant who laughed at prophet Elisha and said that's not possible for God to end the war with Syria next day but the prophet said he says he will he says, you will see it, you will just not eat of it. And the people trampled him next day instead of him eating of the goods that God had promised. I, if you, we're going to pray, my friend, if we're going to intercede as a church, whatever God is doing on this earth, we get a chance to be a part of it. Not criticizing it, not demonizing it, not attacking it, not gossiping it, but we will be a part of what God is doing on this earth. Therefore, we're going to be a praying church. We're going to be a praying generation because prayer prepares us for what God has prepared for us. Somebody say amen. I didn't hear you. Somebody say amen. Prayer prepares you for what God has prepared for you. Prayer does not just prepare an answer. It prepares us for an answer. When you pray for your future husband, God is not just preparing your husband, He's preparing you the wife. When you're preparing for your kids, for your future kids, God is not just preparing your kids, God is preparing also the parents that are praying. When you're praying for your business, God is not just blessing the business, God is also preparing the businessmen. When you are praying as a church, something happens. God is not just making a revival, God is preparing the church for the revival, He's preparing for the church. That's why we got to pray. That's why we got to intercede. Ten things. I'm going to go through them very quickly. Number one thing that I see in Samson that we see also in the church is number one, Samson was born anointed. Samson did not get his anointing later on in life. He was born with it. Church in the book of Acts did not start without the anointing. It was born on the day of Pentecost. Church did not have a season without the power and then one day they got the power. No, the, on the birthday, the church received the power and the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Jesus needed anointing to preach. He needed anointing to teach. He needed anointing to cast out demons. He needed anointing to heal the sick and he needed anointing to make disciples. You and I need anointing. Without anointing whatever we're doing is extremely dangerous. With anointing we are dangerous. Without anointing what we're doing is just motivational speaking. With anointing we're moving mountains. With anointing we're speaking to dry bones. With anointing yoke snaps under the presence of anointing. The Bible says he went out doing good and he under the anointing healed those oppressed by the devil. Without the anointing we can comfort the sick but with the anointing we can heal the sick. Without the anointing we can try to hug a demon out. We can try to counsel the demon out. We could try to medicate the demon out but with, with the anointing we cast the demons out. Come on somebody we need the anointing like never before and that's exactly what the early church had. Had the anointing. Number two. 
Samson went against the gates. Early church, Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Samson went one time, lifted the gates, completely took him off. Early church of Jesus Christ did exactly the same thing. They moved gates of the enemies. They did not necessarily move things politically. They moved things spiritually. They did not necessarily put their politicians in their white houses into the Roman Senate but they moved the grass uh, grassroots movement where the poor were being uh, ministered to where the needy people being taken care of and the Bible says one day one of the critics they said concerning the early church is you filled Jerusalem with your teaching they moved the gates of the enemy the church of Jesus Christ when it's anointed that our church the churches that are watching right now when you are anointed you must understand your biggest war is not going to be against another church. Your biggest war is not going to be against masks and vaccines. Your biggest war is not going to be against Biden or Trump. Your biggest war is going to be against the gates and the strongholds of the enemy. And those gates and strongholds are not physical, they are spiritual. The church's number one assignment, it's a spiritual tank. It's a spiritual bazooka in the hands of God against every plan, every scheme and every weapon of the enemy. I will build my church, Jesus said. That's why every pastor has to resign from calling it his church. He says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. That means the church will do the advancement. That means the church will go forth. That means the church is not going to go in hiding in the basement. The church will advance with its ranks. That means the church will not be a nursery. That means the church is not going to be a social club. The church will be an army. The church will be a warriors, full of warriors that will move forward and the gates of hell will not prevail. Devil, listen to me. I want to warn you because the church is on the rise and the church, you're not going to mess with it. It will not be filled with compromise. It will not be filled with weakness. Listen to me, every demon that has sent an assignment against the church, you will fall. You will fail and Jesus will succeed. His plan will succeed. His purpose will succeed. No gates of hell will prevail against the church. Somebody who is a part of the living church, give Jesus praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Gates of hell will not prevail. Number three, Samson, when he was anointed, he sent foxes into the fields. The early church did exactly the same thing and the anointed church does the same thing today. We empower foxes, young people. We empower ministers. The Bible says the fivefold ministry is given so we can equip the saints for the work of ministry. And what did they do with those foxes? They caught them, which was not easy to catch a fox. And then when he caught them, he merged them two by two and he put fire in their tails. I believe that's exactly what our internship is. We take every tail and uh, have a fire in it. Come on somebody. And wh what did he do with those foxes? He did not send them to a barn, he sent them to a field. Because fire is for the fields. Power is for the purpose. Anointing is for missions. Anointing is not to make you feel good. Anointing is not to give you a dose. Anointing is not to make you slain. Anointing is to drive out demons. Anointing is to heal the sick. Anointing is for the Walmart. Anointing is for the drive through Anointing is for the missions. Anointing is for the university and for college. Anointing is for your family gatherings. Real anointing does not need a church platform. It needs a field. It needs a harvest field and if you are a fox and you know it, if you are a fox with fire in your tail, all you gotta do is be loose. Be loose into your harvest field. Be loose into your platform. Be loose into your sphere of influence and set that place on fire. The Bible says that those who believe in me, these signs will follow. Meaning signs will follow. Everywhere I go, the sign follows. Everywhere I go, miracles go. Everywhere I go, I am the light. Everywhere I go, I am the salt. Everywhere I go, I distribute the love of God. Everywhere I go, I distribute generosity. Everywhere I go, I distribute the goodness of God. I am a fire walking fox. Come on somebody.
whether we go to Brazil, whether we go to Spokane, whether we go to Yakima, whether we go to a football game, whether we go to a gym, whether we go to a coffee shop, you must understand you are a fox sent on a mission, getting fire in your tail. That's exactly what church did. The moment persecution came, they all scattered into the fields, everyone carrying their flame. Philip ended up in uh, in Samaria set the whole place on fire another guy end up another city set the whole place on fire literally the devil's worst nightmare came true why because the church was equipping the saints the church is not one-man show it's about raising up every believer the saints to minister number four Samson killed with the jawbone the early church advanced the cause of Jesus through the jawbone. No sword, no gun, no political affiliation, no Facebook ads, no nonprofit status, no radio slots, no newspapers. The jawbone. Through the jawbone they prayed that the place was shaken because it requires a mouth. Through the jawbone they preached the gospel and 3,000 people got saved on the day of Pentecost. Through the jawbone they proclaimed to the sick to be healed, to the demonized to be free. Through the jawbone they prophesied. Through the jawbone they advanced the kingdom of God. Through the jawbone they praised God in the jail prison cells. I want to tell you today that God till this day wants to use your mouth. Sometimes we say, well, I don't have a lot of education. I don't have a lot of connection. I'm not as so pretty. I'm not as so, you know, um, attractive or influential in the community. Can you give God your jaw? Can you give God your mouth? He says, and I will fill it. Open it and I will fill it. Could you open up your mouth? Some of us got in so much trouble because we opened our mouth. Some of us, we slept on our couches as husband because we opened our mouth some of you here today you lost your marriage because you kept your mouth open too long and the devil used your mouth to get you into trouble but I want to let you know the reason why he was using your mouth to get you into trouble because devil knew that God always wanted to use somebody's mouth he wants to use your mouth to bring somebody to Christ he wants you to open up your mouth and invite somebody to church he wants you to open up your mouth and tell somebody about what you've been going through so that it will help somebody else he wants you to open up your mouth when you're going through a difficult things and give God praise give God thanks and worship him and you'll come out of that situation he wants you to open up your mouth when you feel like the world is against you get on your knees and begin to storm heaven because your solution, your key, your breakthrough is your jawbone. It's your mouth. When you open up your mouth, things shift. Atmosphere shifts. See what happens if I would just think a sermon, none of you will get blessed. If the worship team will think the song, none of you will get blessed. But because we open our mouth, something begins to happen. The atmosphere shifts faith is being built God is being glorified demons are being trembling sickness leaves why because when I open up my mouth miracles start to happen when I open up my mouth salvation starts to happen when I open up my mouth demons flee when I open up my mouth the lost will be saved somebody open up your mouth and give God some Everyone on Zoom, turn on your camera and give God some praise right now. Turn on your camera and come on, wake up those kids. Begin to praise God. Begin to worship God. Begin to worship God. Begin to speak in tongues. Begin to worship His name. Call on His name. Worship His name. Demons will leave. Sickness will go. Depression will subside and be defeated. Thank you, Lord. Touch your neighbors to open up your mouth. And that's exactly what church did. Number five, Samson, he started to compromise and he lost the anointing. That's exactly what happened with the early church. During dark ages, Constantine faced Western Roman Emperor at the Tiber River in, 300, in 310 AD. Constantine saw a flaming cross in the sky bearing the words, in this sign thou shalt conquer. 
the next year Constantine now the Western Roman Emperor and the Eastern Roman Emperor signed Edict of Milan which finally ensured religious tolerance for Christians the agreement granted freedom of worship to all regardless of deity and brought the end of the age of martyrs which began after Jesus's death Christians were now given specific legal rights such as the return of confiscated property and the right to organize dedicated churches which was beautiful and amazing but there was one problem with it today's compromise becomes tomorrow's chain yesterday's complacency is today's compromise church became comfortable and comfort for churches usually doesn't do well church started to compromise this bibles were taken away from everyday christian religion became so popular people became priests because it was popular and because it paid well conversions became fake religion quickly slipped into politics and people who did not accept christianity were murdered were killed and it's what the historians call the dark ages kind of like what happened with samson he started to compromise and he lost his anointing i want to encourage you today that we are called not to conform to this world if we want to be transformed by the renewing of our mind god never called the church to fit in he called us to stand out god never called us to be popular god called us to be powerful god never called the world to consider us wise god called the world to consider us dangerous if we truly believe and follow what we follow in the bible we will always be at odds with the system of the world whom the scripture says is under the sway of the wicked one this world is controlled by the devil we have to be at odds god is raising up the three hebrew boys again god is raising up the daniels in this generation again god is raising up the josephs and the esthers again they will stand at odds with the systems of this world and therefore we shouldn't embrace the culture because we're called to affect it and the first thing the scripture says before you can be changed you have to refuse to blend in i'm not talking about not learning the language or going to schools i'm talking about when we embrace the lifestyle when we embrace the idols when we embrace the ideologies of this world it's slipping into the church it used to be that you are dead to your sin today you're just depressed it used to be the sin is a wickedness today it's a weakness that you work on you don't repent from it's something you struggle it's not something you need to repent from oh you just feel down and if you come we give you a little jolt before it used to be that you're dead in your sin and you're headed to a christless eternity and the cross is the only solution but today there's many solutions therapy counseling there's few verses we can give you and it's slipping in into the church but i believe god is restoring as it happened with samson it's going to be happening uh, is happening even with the mainstream church in the world what happened with Samson next is that Samson not only start compromising but Samson starts going in circles and that's exactly what happened with mid-age with dark ages the early church who was powerful started to compromise and then it started to go into circles there was no revivals there was no move of God they started to persecute genuine Christians and that's exactly what started to happen with Christians but then I'm so glad for this to start to take place is that number seven is the Samson's hair started to grow God started to restore the message of the cross, salvation by grace, depravity of sin, the wickedness of sin, the repentance through the blood. God started to restore when Martin Luther came in in 1517 and he, he nailed those 95 theses to a Catholic church at the time and says this is off. That's not what the scripture teaches. When in 1900 William Seymour in Azusa Street a black man who was not educated came and started to preach about speaking in tongues when later on the the healing revival started to hit america when the worship revival started to hit america when the prayer revival started to hit korea when the revelation about disciples
discipleship and small groups started to hit Colombia and started to hit Korea when God started to revive the ministry of deliverance the ministry of prophetic what started to happen in this prison when Samson was going into circles is that his hair started to grow and I believe that after these dark ages the church God started pulling the church out God started to pull the church out he's the hair of discipleship the hair of worship the hair of prophetic the hair of fivefold ministry the hair of deliverance from demons the hair of healing of the sick started to grow and the church started to become powerful and the church started to stand on its feet and the church started to become glorious again and the church started to become powerful again and we are in that place right now what I believe God is restoring to the church what the church lost in the book of Acts I believe that we will see greater things in the last days that the church seen in the book of Acts somebody say amen number eight we see that in the last time the Samson's hair started to grow back and then we see this last victory and I read this verse as the Bible says that though Samson was blind and he was already older he took a lad a lad is a teenager a lad is a young man the Bible says that the lad took the Samson's hand and led Samson to these last two poles that Samson was leaning on and I believe that this is what is happening in our generation right now is there is a resurgence there is a resurrection there is this quickening that is taking place with young people God is beginning to raise up the children God is beginning to raise up the teenagers all around the world. God is quickening young people. In the last days, says the Lord, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, your sons and your daughters. God is not only touching the grandpas and the grandmas. God is not only touching people that grew up in the Brazil revival, Toronto outpouring or some other. God is raising up the fame, fame, faceless, nameless. The ones that many people look at and says they're going to die victims. Gen C generation. More died last two years out of suicide than out of COVID. They feel a sense of hopelessness. But in the church, the Gen Z generation, the millennial generation gets a fresh hunger that is a fresh awakening that is a fresh thirst that exists for God that did not exist before because God is raising up the lads God is raising up the kids they will take the hand of the adults and will say together the young and the old the passion of the young and the wisdom of the old will march into the greatest revival the church has ever seen Father we are ready, Lord we are ready, Holy Ghost we are ready. That's why there is an emphasis on young people at Hungry Gen. That's why there is an emphasis on young people online right now. Because God is doing something special. He's merging two generations. We're not going to be at odds with each other. We're going to fight for each other. Are you with me? It's going to be a nameless, faithless generation. It's not going to be about the stage. It's going to be about serving. It's not going to be a man with a microphone. It's going to be about people with a mission. Number nine, Samson had the greatest victory at the end of his life. And I believe the church will have the greatest impact on the world at the end of age. We see that in Matthew 14, 24, 14, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations. Then the end shall come. God is not waiting for the birth of Antichrist. God is not waiting for the mandates to go further. God is not waiting for COVID passports. God is not waiting for another strain. God is waiting for this gospel to be preached to all the earth. That's why church, if you want the end to come closer, get busy preaching. The preaching of the gospel is what regulates the end times. Antichrist is a footnote in the end times. Antichrist is not the leader. Antichrist and his stooge, a false prophet and false teacher, they don't dictate the timeline of God. God says in the last days the gospel will be preached and then the end shall come. We determine the end, not him. Come on somebody. 
Isaiah 60 verse 1, 2 or 3 and rise and shine for your light has come for the glory of God has risen upon you for behold the darkness shall cover the earth and deep darkness the people but the Lord will arise over you and his glory will be seen upon you the Gentiles will come to your light and the kings to the brightness of your rising Haggai chapter 2 verse 9 it says the glory of the latter temple will be greater than the former says the Lord of hosts and to this place I will give peace says the Lord of hosts Daniel chapter 2 verse 35 even though it deals with the millennial but it gives us a good appetizer then the iron the clay and the bronze and the silver and the gold were crushed together and became like shaft from the summer threshing floor the wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found and the stone that struck the image became a great mountain somebody say great mountain and fill the whole earth so it's not just gonna fill the tri cities it's gonna fill washington it's gonna fill oregon it's gonna fill north america it's gonna fill latin america it's going to fill asia it's going to fill the whole earth the bible says moreover the law entered and that the offense may abound but where the sin abounded the grace abounded much more romans chapter 5 verse 20 habakkuk 2 14 and the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of god as the waters cover the sea i understand some of these verses i pulled from the rug of the millennial but it gives us the same main concept the lord is on the move in the last days and he will do something special through his local church as i bring this close this service to a close i want to share with you the last thing samson lost his life in his victory and the church will also face its greatest persecution with the greatest revival yeah. I do believe persecution is coming I believe the persecution has come to many places and in the United States and even in the Western circles we have to get ready for a great outpouring of God and a great persecution but what I love in this is that Samson Philistines didn't take his life he gave it away he gave his life away to have the greatest victory the price for this revival is not going to be more praying it's not going to be a longer fast the price for this revival is you're going to have to give your life away your life my friend God is not asking for another 10% in your schedule he says I want you and once your whole life is given away you're not afraid of persecution because you have no more life Satan can't take what's not yours and when the devil comes and he says I'm gonna kill you you say I would I died already you're not a threat I am a threat you're not a threat when you lie your life down, like our, fr our brother shared, when you lay it down, my friend, there is no fear of persecution. There is no fear of beheading. There is no fear of jail. There is no fear of having a property confiscated. You, you are a threat when you're not afraid to die. What makes terrorists dangerous is they have no value for life. What makes you as Christians dangerous is when you value the Lord so much that you give Him your life. You can't live your life where your life is dearer to you than it was to Jesus Christ. To Jesus, his life was not dear to him as pleasing his father. Early disciples had the same view. And church, for us to see a great outpouring of God, there is a price. And the price is this, we're going to have to be willing to lay our life down. If you don't surrender your life, I give you a prophetic word, you will waste it. At best. If you're educated, you will waste your life. If you're not educated, you're not clever, did not come from a good family, you're not going to even waste your life. You're going to destroy your life with your bad decisions. Breakups, bad decision there, bad business deal there, bad relationship there, bad friends there, went somewhere else and an accident, somebody got involved, you got, attacked, got fired there. You will destroy your life or you will waste your life. But Jesus says, I want you to surrender it completely. He says, if you give it, I can use it to bring the greatest glory on this earth. The price for revival is very simple. It's your life. I want you to lay it down. Then serving at one more service, piece of cake. Praying, piece of cake. Why? Because it's no longer yours. As long as it's your own, you will fear. Oh, 
We get in trouble with this. Oh, I'm going to lose my job. It's all about you. I. And so why? Because you're still holding on to life. But when you surrender, I'm not saying you're reckless, but you become a threat. Because you're a dead man walking. You're dead to yourself.